Guess you feel you'll always be The Lord of the Rings, a name that needs no introduction. In terms of fantasy, Tolkien's books are probably the most iconic franchise of that genre. Even people who have no interest in fantasy know about Lord of the Rings. Look, here's a test. Just think of the word fantasy. What images does that conjure in your brain? Probably imagining magic, maybe elves and dwarfs. Maybe you're thinking about brave heroes fighting demons. Well guess what? You're thinking about Lord of the Rings. That's how much the books influence that genre. Sure, the three books contain an epic overarching adventure full of magic, strange creatures, battles and friendship and the quest to defeat evil. But it's the world that really captures people's imagination. Tolkien made it seem like he'd witnessed the events first hand, somehow got teleported back to Earth and he just wrote it all down. Middle Earth's lore is that expansive, they brought out the Lord of the Rings reader's companion. And as most people know, there's the Samarillion, which is all about the history of Middle Earth up to the Third Age. Tolkien could fill books with just background information. What a man. Although, when most people think about the franchise, it's usually the New Line Cinema films directed by Peter Jackson that comes to mind. While I haven't read much of the books, as far as adaptations go, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better transition from book to screen. The trilogy was unlike anything anybody had seen before. The sets, the backgrounds, the effects, the lighting and the acting. Well, the acting can be touch and go there. <laughs> and the CGI is questionable in parts. But the films on the whole are great. Oh, and how could we forget about the music? How it sure score with its interlocking themes and motifs that weave it in and out on depending on who or what is in the scene. Literal musical perfection. Sure, there was adaptations previously. I remember really enjoying watching that surreal animated movie on video when I was a child. But the book's scope and spectacle really needed to be seen on the big screen. And that's where Peter Jackson delivered. With Return of the King bagging Jackson 11 Oscars and winning Best Film that year. While Return of the King is my least favourite of the trilogy, it was well deserved for Jackson and everyone involved for accomplishing such a monumental task. And looking at Jackson in the end, it looks like you put on the walk. So for Bill and Joan, thank you. thank you. The DVDs for the trilogy are incredibly well put together and presented. Looks as if they put as much effort into making these as they did with making the actual movie. They all have expanded cuts of the film and come with all these great extras. Like behind the scenes, commentaries, interviews with the cast and crew. And swaths of information on how something on this scale was achieved. The behind the scenes is almost as entertaining as the movie itself. Most of it you could probably find on YouTube. You should give it a watch. Well, watch your time. I'm like, hey guys, I'm I'm embarrassed to take this on set. I'm gonna get laughed off set. This is so ridiculously large. Oh, okay. Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about the video games. Now, with the franchise popularity, probably the highest it's ever been, meant a ton of video games to cash in on the fad. These are just a few I own physically. Most people probably remember the tie-in games developed by EA to coincide with the movie. That's right EA, yeah I know how it sounds, but this is back when they had standards. Apparently Jackson is a big fan of video games, but had no direct involvement with the EA games. He did however contribute in the development of the King Kong tie-in game, but we'll save that for another video. Look, it comes with these watercolour stills from the game, what a strange inclusion for a collector's item. And so we have it, the two towers and the return of the king. Yeah, these are games I remember everyone owning back in the day. They're both very similar. So let's talk about Return of the King, which is seen by many as the better game. It's a fairly typical hack and slash, with some very light RPG elements. It's got the spectacle and the flair from the movie, which elevates it among its peers. You can play as multiple characters, beat up all manner of ghosts, goblins and orcs, while you level up and buy new moves. It takes place in linear levels that expand on scenes from the movie. It's pretty standard stuff, but it's well done. There's local co-op, so you can do the whole thing with a buddy, which is always fun. But the fixed camera angle can be a pain. Certain angles can mess with your depth perception. There are light and heavy attacks, and tons of combos to learn. By pressing R2, you even got the option to perform a finishing move on knockdown enemies. It's incredibly satisfying to pull off. Lord almighty, look at Gimli's finisher. Don't you think that's a little excessive? Does Gimli really need to spin his axe all across his body before killing the enemy? Man, what a show off. Hey, it still only counts as one. So overall, 
what more could you want from a movie tie-in game? It's well worth playing if at least to unlock some of the extras. The Hobbits on Gaming makes it worth playing for that reason alone. Billy is awful. One of the worst game players of all time. I think I do have a, a special gift for gaming. Eventually the rights were taken over by Warner Brothers and they have been pumping out a new game every so often. Although based on the movies, they mostly go their own way. They won't blow you away or anything, but they're not bad if you're looking for something different. The Nemesis system in the Monolith games is such an interesting and fun mechanic, it's worth giving that offshoot a try if you're a fan of unique mechanics in games. For people who just want to play through the movie trilogy, I recommend the Third Age and the Lego game. The Third Age is a turn-based RPG, very similar to Final Fantasy, apart from it's more linear. It retells the movies in a very surreal way, as you play as new characters as they travel through all the iconic parts of the trilogy. Battle your way through Mordor as you level up, equip new gear, with item and party management. It's not bad now. Although the battle animations are way too long. On the plus side, the score from the film playing in the background of the battles makes them way more epic than they have any right to be. And fighting the literal giant flaming eye at the end has to be witnessed first hand for its absurdity. They need to bring this one to PC. The Lego game on the other hand is pretty self-explanatory. The trilogy but in Lego form but more of a sense of humour about everything. If you've played any LEGO games before, you know what to expect. A platforming collectathon with some character based puzzles. You won't be challenged, but the open world and humour makes this worth trying for any fan. Saruman. Look at this picture, doesn't something seem off here? So we've got 3 books of movies, but only 2 tie-in games. What happened to the Fellowship? Well there was a Fellowship game, but it has nothing to do with the films. It was based on the book and came out a year after the Fellowship film. Yeah, this was the reason EA didn't make a Fellowship game. It's probably why most of the Fellowship levels are packed into the two towers. It was published by Vivendi Games, well I think that's how you pronounce it. They were known at the time as Black Label Studios. They seemed to publish nothing but tie-in games. The company had a partnership with Tolkien Enterprises who held the rights to the video game adaptation of Tolkien's literary works. Whilst Electronic Arts held the rights to the video game adaptations of the New Line Cinema films. It was initially developed by WXP for the original Xbox, before being ported over to PC and Playstation. Which makes sense to me, as it has a very fable look about it. And it came out before, so maybe it inspired it, who knows. The novelty of it meant I had to give it a try. It must have been in development before the first film's release. So I wonder, did the developers walk out of the cinema after watching the first film thinking oh we fucked up but had no choice but to finish it? For the upscale graphics and widescreen, I plan to do this review with the PC version. Now while it's super cheap to buy a disc copy, however, since my PC doesn't have a disc drive and there's no legal way to buy it digitally, I'd have to get a download copy working, which doesn't seem too difficult, but trying to run old games on new hardware can cause a lot of funky stuff to happen. And it's incredibly hard to tell if it's the game working as intended, glitches and all, or is it the modern hardware causing it to happen. It's also the reason I don't want to emulate the game. I unintentionally proved my point, because the footage you are watching now of Nocturne, an old game that's also no longer available, keeps crashing on my computer. So for a more authentic and objective view of the game, I'll be playing the PS2 version. Look at the cover, it looks kinda plain. I mean if you didn't know what Lord of the Rings was, there'd be no way this would catch your attention. I mean look at the Third Age cover art. Now that's what I call an epic fantasy adventure. Believe it or not this game went platinum. Something tells me the movie had a lot to do with it. I mean how many people were swindled into buying this thinking it was based on the movie version. Look, there is no models of the in-game characters on the box. Except for the Black Rider, but he's obscured in shadow. They knew if they had any of their in-game characters on the box, there'd be no mistake in this for the movie and they could kiss those sales goodbye. But with the platinum version, the cover art is actually worse. Oh isn't this great? Just take over the entire box with a dull silver background so I can barely see the cover. I get that PlayStation wants you to know it sold a lot of copies, but don't you think it's a little excessive? Could they have just a small silver stripe saying platinum? Like this? Would that not have looked better? God, imagine if they still did that today. It's here, it's here, I can't wait, I can't wait. It's the new Hideo Kojima game. Oh wait, what now? What the fuck is this? I can't see anything. Anyway, enough messing around, let's start this thing. I'm playing with a HDMI connector for the PS2. I don't think it actually makes anything look better, it's just for convenience sake. 
So, let's insert the disc, begin a new game, and get the show on the road. So it starts with a CGI rendered cutscene, giving us the setup for the game. Very similar to the film, only it's not as good, and it's way more abridged. Now, it's one of those things, where you'd be lost if you hadn't read the book or seen the movie. But at the same time, I'm glad they keep it short for people who already know the story. But then the real game starts. Welcome back, Gandalf. Will we have fireworks? Elvish lessons? Tales of ancient Numenor? Today, we must talk about a shadow of the past. The ring you inherited may be very dangerous. Uncle Bilbo's magic ring? Magic rings, as you call them, were made by elves. But this ring, I think, was made by another. Give me the ring. Yeah, so much for Gandalf not wanting to touch the ring so it doesn't corrupt him. The voice acting? Well, look, it's okay. It's just okay. It would be unfair to compare it to the movie that has world-renowned actors in it, like. However, it's not just that it's silly. I mean, the films and the books had their fair share of silly moments too. But the limited facial animations, dead-eyed expressions, static camera angles, and cheesy delivery... Dropping. Eavesdropping? Uh, there ain't no eaves at back end. Means the game's acting is more akin to a cartoon like 1960s Scooby-Doo than epic fantasy. Where we go? <laughs> like next time, signal. And in some ways, that's insulting to Scooby-Doo because the voice acting and animation was probably better. So Gandalf gives Frodo the backstory behind the ring. You all know the story. Frodo inherits the ring from Bilbo. It's the wrong ring to rule them all, because it can only be destroyed from where it was created. It needs to be taken all the way to Mordor and thrown into Mount Doom. The ring corrupts people and draws the Dark Lord's servants, forcing Frodo to leave his hometown. Now, I'm not an expert on the lore or anything, but it seems to me it sets up the stakes well enough for first time players. Remember this scene from the movie? Obviously if you've read the books or watched the film, you'll remember a lot of scenes that happen throughout the game. But since this is a game, not a book or film, I'll stop comparing it to both and just take it for what it is. Moving on, a year later goes by and Gandalf doesn't return. So we continue on without him. Frodo needs to sell house and say goodbye. He needs to leave the Shire and seek Elrond in Riverdell. And with that, the adventure finally begins. I had to say farewell to my neighbours and sell my home to Lobelia Sackville Baggins. We start the game here in Bag End, Frodo's family home. You can't leave right away, instead you're given some small objectives to complete before we can head out on the road. Find the bag end deed and get the key to the house. We're trying to sell the house to Lobelia Sackville. There's no real tutorials in the game, just helpful messages that pop up in the bottom left hand corner. I like this a lot, it's an adventure game, let me figure it out for myself. By holding down R2, you'll open your inventory and you can select items by scrolling up and down, Metal Gear Solid style. So. Almost immediately, I went to put on the ring, but Frodo doesn't have it yet. The one ring is in this chest. I'd best leave it here until I sell Bag End. Huh, guess we can't till later. Anyway, I get lost a couple of times in the house, but eventually I find the deed and the key, and it's time to explore the Shire. You talk to Sam for a brief moment. You know Sam. Your bodyguard is Gardner. And off you go. You're free to explore the Shire at your leisure. You can press square to attack with your stick, it's pretty useless for the moment. I do my best to knock the living daylights out of Sam, but it doesn't do anything, oh well. The graphics? Uh, they're fair enough. Just keep in mind, Jack and Daxter was already out, and those graphics still hold up for the most part today. However, with games of this generation, there is a certain amount of roughness you come to expect in the controls and graphics. Now, the character models are decent enough, and the lighting can be striking at times. The use of bright colours really makes the environment pop, especially here in the Shire, and there's plenty of little details to look at. But the animations are dreadful, both in and out of gameplay. I'm talking real bad. People's mouths just flap open and closed, everyone has dead-eyed expressions. Even important scenes lack any real quality. Everything just looks fucking awkward. Now I have to mention this. I'm only 5 minutes into the game and it's already doing my head in. The camera is a pain. The start you can't look up and down, only zoom in and out. Maybe this was done so the camera doesn't get stuck in the environment, except it gets stuck all the time. But really, it's the camera movement left and right I have a problem with. First off, it takes way too long to move. Second, if you press the analog over to the left, the camera goes right. 
press over to the right, the camera goes left. Now, I don't mind inverted controls for up and down in like a flying game, but inverted left and right when you need to move the camera all the time drives me crazy and there is no option to change it. So if you see the camera going side to side, that's why. Just down the path is a platforming tutorial. Frodo can climb ladders, jump and even grab ledges. The jump is floaty and imprecise. This opening tutorial gives the impression like you'll be doing a lot of platforming. However, and this is no joke, you could probably count the amount of times you need to jump in this game on one hand. You can throw stones with the suckle button and press L2 to go into first person for more precise aiming, but they don't do much. You'd think you'd use the stones to solve puzzles, but I can only think of two times you have to do so and one of them is an optional side quest. Really, it's for distracting enemies. So you're running around talking to people, collecting side quests, helping hobbits, finding out more about the Shire, all while you look for the lady to sell your house to. That's another thing, Frodo can heal himself by eating mushrooms. Yeah, eating mushrooms alright. What is with these conversations? Hello there Hal. Hello Frodo. Hello? Hello as in hello? What a strange way to say it. Hello Frodo. Have time to enjoy a mug with me? Hello Sheriff. Just saying goodbye. Sheriff? As in Sheriff? I know my pronunciation isn't great, but what the hell is going on with these words? They have no problem using real months and dates in this fantasy world, but hello and sheriff are too obvious? Maybe it's a book thing, maybe it's a law thing, I don't know. You're given a to-do list, but there is no quest markers or compass pointing you in which way to go. Sure, it's confusing, and yes you can get lost easily, but that's half the fun. And the areas are small enough that you learn the layout quickly. You can meet Merry and Pippin in the Green Dragon. Believe it or not, they want Frodo to go to an old man's farm and steal his mushrooms. What an odd request. This farm? We thought we'd ever go at his garden again. Three is company, just like old times. Remember those mushrooms? Yeah, I think I can figure this out. I mean, look at the dark circles on the Pippin's eyes. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, look at them. The three of them are fucking junkies. They've all been getting high as a kite on fucking mushrooms. Now they've resorted to stealing from an old man to get their fix. After you complete more side quests, that's what the other hobbits reward you with. Mushrooms. The town has been enabling Frodo's drug addiction. No wonder Frodo does such a good job carrying the ring. He's been doped out of his little hobbit mind this whole time. It's his excessive consumption of mushrooms. Stealing mushrooms from the farm has you throwing stones to distract the farmer's dogs. If you get caught, you're given a scolding from the farmer and have to start again. The stealth, if that's what you want to call it, is terrible. Don't bother trying to stay out of sight or moving slowly or anything to do with being sneaky because none of it works. Just stay far enough away, throw a stone to distract the enemy and just gun it for the objective. There is no other way that's effective. Look what the manual says. Frodo is nimble and adept at moving stealthily. Yeah, right. By the way, there is no map in the game. Well, technically that's not true. There is a world map but it's impractical and you'll never use it. So basically you just roam around, taking the sights and sounds. That's what a lot of this early section is, exploring around, interacting with NPCs and doing favours for people. Even for how limited it is, I have to say being able to wander around the Shire, go into Frodo's house, climb the mill, explore the creek and raid the farm, all while being able to have conversations with the other hobbits. It does scratch a certain itch as a fan of the franchise. Most importantly, the game trusts the player to figure it out for themselves. Eventually, you'll find Lobelia. She wants you to ring the bell for the sheriff. I mean, sorry, the sheriff. Because of wolves, apparently. Yet no one has seen any. Man, this whole town seems like they're on drugs. You do that, but the sheriff doesn't take much notice. Anyway, done with that, you hand over the deed and the key and return back to Bag End for the ring. Up to now, it's been pretty typical RPG stuff. Which is strange because the game is not an RPG. There is no levels or stats, you can't even upgrade anything. The game in essence is a very linear and limited hack and slash. And this opening section is almost like an entirely different game. Anyway, you pick up the ring and we transition into the night. The night time is dark. I mean literally pitch black. You can't see a fucking thing. I believe this is why the game has you learn the layout earlier. Because it would be impossible to know where the fuck you're going in the dark. Oh. And the game has no brightness settings by the way. Sure, could I turn the brightness up on my TV? But that would be cheating and it makes the game look like shit. 
See, this could be a problem with playing on a modern TV, the recording software, or playing with HDMI. Hell, maybe it's intentional. I just don't know. For now, I just have to assume it was meant to be this dark. There's no secret. He's walking to Buckleberry or some such place. Is this place far from here? Yes, quite a ways down the East Road. Never been so far myself. They're a strange lot in Buckland. That's real intimidating, ain't it? One of the main antagonists of the game getting lost and stopping to ask for directions. What's more impressive is this hobbit's reaction to the whole thing. And you said a message. No, I can't give no message. Now, good night to you. Man, this guy takes shit from no one. Maybe he should carry the ring to Mordor. MG. Good evening to you, Frodo. Amazing. Him and Frodo exchanging pleasantries. As if the prior scene of the mysterious Black Rider pulling out his sword and riding off to go on a murdering spree didn't happen. So this starts a sneaking mission in the dark against the Black Rider. You know, the enemies that are entirely dressed in all black from head to toe. Oh, and that are also on black horses. As you can imagine, it's an absolute fucking nightmare to spot them here. But you do have one tool to help. A suckle appears to let you know you're in range of an enemy. White means there's an enemy nearby. Yellow means they're close, and red means you're fucked. You're guaranteed to get caught on your first go. This is a beginner's trap, because if the Black Rider catches Frodo, it's an immediate game over and you're sent back to the main menu. That's right, no continues, there's no autosave or checkpoints, none of that. Before this point, I don't think you can die, or even fail the game in any way. So if you haven't saved up to now, you have to do it all over again from the beginning. Now. It doesn't take too long to regain your progress, but why not have a continue option? I just don't get it. As a child, this was the exact trap I fell for, but I've learned my lesson. That's right, it's one of those games. Now you know the game can have an instant fail state, any time you do anything of any significance in the game, you save. Kill an enemy, save. Go to a new area, save. Collect an item, save. Oh, this is just pure trial and error, don't bother sneaking. As I've said, just throw stones and run. Oh, isn't that great? Put a black ride on the bridge blocking the path ahead. The if Lady Luck is on your side, you'll get through it. A wolf! I'm done for! Hold on, Robin. Frodo, look out! What a strange form of karmic justice. This is your combat tutorial where you beat a wolf to death with a stick. It's pretty straightforward. You save the sheriff and press on. This is where Frodo gets attacked by wolves. Yeah, remember that from the books? Obviously I try to fight them all, but it doesn't go well. I think they might be invincible, so obviously I die. But by now, you're saving every 30 seconds, so it shouldn't be a problem. If the help message hasn't given it away, you're meant to use the ring to go invisible and sneak by. So I put on the ring and die in like 10 seconds. Yeah, it's only got a very short meter, but it's enough to get you through. The next part is another Black Rider. Throw stones and run, not more to it. Now we meet up with the other hobbits on the farm. They already know about the ring, and they're here to help, supposedly. Maggot too, by the sound of it. So much for stealing some mushrooms before we go. <sighs> Mordor is chasing after them, the fate of the world hangs in the balance, and they just want mushrooms. What can you say? They need serious help. It seems like no one has any urgency for the situation they're in whatsoever. Mary had been in the old forest, and knew a little of its ways. It's a dark, mysterious place, but not as dangerous as a Black Rider. So yeah, the next level is in the forest. Somehow, the other hobbits get lost, and Frodo has to find them. Here, you'll fight spiders, and the combat? Well, well, it's awful. Now, it does get a little better when you switch characters later in the game, but for now, it's the worst. I'll go into more why later, but for now, all you need to know is that the lock-on doesn't work, and you're either stunlocking the enemy, or the enemy is stunlocking you. When you find the hobbits, they're meant to help you in combat, but they mostly just get lost in the environment and stuck on things. If my drug theory is correct, at least it makes sense that the hobbits are stumbling around. Anyway, you find all the hobbits, and we're on to the next level. Here the three stooges are attacked by a tree, and it's up to Frodo to save them. This is the first boss fight in the game. 
so we watch the cutscene and here we go. Okay, suddenly it's gone fixed camera angles, never done that before. So what do I do here? It's telling me not to hit the trunk. Okay, can't go over to the side. Okay, can I stand at the back? Okay, can't go at the back. Whoa! Oh, pff, don't know what I did wrong there. Seems like I can't stand anywhere. Jeez, I'm just getting stabbed everywhere and now I'm repeatedly being stabbed. And now I'm dead. Well, points for trying, I suppose. So don't stand away from it. What you need to do is hit the branches when they slam down. Don't hit the trunk. That just pisses the tree off. You've only got a second to hit the thing. So if you're lucky, you'll get one or two hits in. The hit detection has a mind all of its own. So don't bother trying to dodge or discern a pattern. Don't sit there thinking I'll come up with a strategy. Just gulp down mushrooms and keep at it. Eventually you'll kill it. Tom Bombadil then comes to the rescue and saves the hobbits from the carnivorous tree. So Frodo fighting the boss was kind of pointless. Now believe it or not, these scenes actually happen in the book more or less. And after watching all this play out, it makes total sense to me why Tom and the tree was cut from the film. Tom does a great job at delaying the story on tangents not related to the plot. Like for example, what we are about to do now. Tom wants the hobbits to collect lilies to have dinner in his house. I guess the whole saving the world thing can wait. So I'm running around looking for flowers with the hobbits. Here there is a shit ton of spiders and after fighting enough of them, I've come to realise it is absolutely pointless fighting anything with Frodo. First, the hobbits are no help whatsoever. Second, Frodo only has a 3 hit combo and his short reach means you'll miss way too often. Combat with him is far too simple, slow and utterly tedious. So my tip for anyone playing this, you're better off just running past everything. Anyway, we collect the flowers, take way too long finding Tom again, rest the night and continue the journey. So we walk no more than 40 meters to the Barrow Downs before setting up camp again. Because video game logic. And guess what? Sam? Merry? Pippin? Where are you? You wake up in the morning to find the hobbits missing again and you have to locate them. We're not even two hours in and the game has already run out of ideas. Here the area is full of ghosts. You know the drill. Don't bother fighting. Just run and hope you stumble upon where the game wants you to go. You'll find the hobbits captured in a cave, trapped by a white or something like that. Looks like a golem knockoff, that's all I know. Anyway, your stick does no damage, so you need to grab a nearby sword in a chest. The boss pukes acid on you. What a great visual metaphor for this game. The game is literally getting sick on you. It's a very painful boss to fight. There is no technique. Just have those mushrooms ready and just hit the thing. How this gets resolved is comical. Frodo sings a song to summon Tom, who himself appears and sings a song to defeat the boss. Yeah, it's Lord of the Rings the musical. Oh, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, oh, by water, wood and hill, by the reed and the willow, by fire, sun and moon. Out, old white, vanish in the sunlight, shrivel like the cold mist, till the world is mended, out into the barren lands. It's lucky the boss will politely sit by and allow this to happen. Tom and Frodo must have one hell of a voice. Be darker than the darkness, where gates stand forever shut, till the world is mended. I just love you, like, it's the reason why I love music so much, it transcends anything, and you have such a gift. Like, just listening to you, all I could do is just exhale and just breathe. Just listening to you, I could listen to you. Forever, you have a voice of the heavens. Again, the point of Frodo fighting this boss? I have absolutely no idea, since Tom does all the work. Finally, after this, we make it to Bray for the Prancing Pony, and the story is back on track. So, we are at the inn in Bray. Frodo is using the name Underhill, and you talk to the mysterious ranger. Then you check in. The room we have left. Here's your key, then. Nob! Nob, you woolly-footed slowcoach, where are you? Here, sir, here I am. They call the character Nob. The game is practically writing the jokes for me. So a drunk Pippin is compromised in the group, until Frodo gets up, does the jig, and starts singing. Make a stew so brown that the man in the moon himself flew down at night to eat his fill. Uh, uh, oh. Where did he go? Uh, I mean, it's amazing. I'm speechless. Don't worry, after a few performances, will they be able to show us something new? Right. That was a whole nother dimension. That was wonderful. Yeah, I would agree. 
This is where you'll realise that the game feels like it's been rushed out the door. Probably to come out before the second movie. As blatant contrivances are used. Old Strider. And if what I say is helpful to you, I want you to take me with you. I would not agree to any such thing until I knew a lot more about you. So, Frodo doesn't know whether or not he can believe Strider. Then this happens. Begging your pardon, I need a word. Everyone in this place needs a word. I remembered what it was I forgot. What? About a shire hobbit named Baggins, but called Underhill. Who told you this? Gandalf the wizard. He asked me to send this letter to you in the shire, but I forgot. Dear Frodo, bad news. You must leave for Rivendell before the end of July. Do not wait for your birthday. I will meet you if I can. Or follow you if I can't. You can trust the ranger called Strider, but make sure he's the real Strider. His true name is Aragorn. So now we play as Aragorn. To do what? Find one of the hobbits, of course. Again. His sword has got a much longer reach, and he uses a bow instead of throwing stones. This should make the game more enjoyable, right? Well, here you fight the only human enemies in the game bandits. There's only four of them, and they never show up again. But these four are the hardest enemies in the entire game. I'm not joking. Consider this the final boss. They don't get stun locked like the other enemies, and your block sucks. First, it's hard to get the block to register. Second, you still take a ton of damage regardless. They don't have any wind up animations either, and there is no telegraphs to their attacks. So you can forget about planning, or strategy, or anything like that. Each battle is just a war of attrition. This probably goes without saying, but make sure you save after every fight. So, you find Merry, and of course he gives you no explanation on why he was out here. Ah, there you are, Merry. Who are you? They call me Strider. I am a friend of Gandalf. Very well, friend. What should we do now? You will perform oral sex on me. Very well, friend. I'm going to collect some items to make decoys of you hobbits. You'll see. So you gotta find the items, four in total. Simple enough, if it wasn't for the bandits. This is the only time the hobbits are helpful in a fight. Out of the four bandits, this spear guy is the worst. He can take way too many hits and dishes out way too much damage. This is where Merry comes in handy. As far as I know, your companions can't die. So get him to focus on Merry and just hit him with arrows. My lord. How much damage can this guy take? Oh my god, it's still going. It's still going. Finally. Jesus game, don't you think that's enough? Now you've just beaten the hardest single enemy in the game, but we're not done. You fight two bandits together next. The camera is too far pulled in to make fighting multiple enemies viable. This game doesn't have a traditional lock-on. Instead, you can press R1 to point yourself in the general direction of the enemy. And it's okay for like shooting arrows, but the camera still needs to be moved manually, defeating one of the main purposes of a lock-on in the first place. Lock-ons are meant to do two things. Keep you targeted on an enemy, and keep the camera focused on them at all times. This only does one, and the R1 will freak out when enemies are close to each other. So, you'll be fighting the camera this whole time as well. Thankfully, the enemy AI and patting will save you time and time again, as they all run around the shop and not react. As you can imagine, this took me a few tries, and by the time I successfully killed them all and found all the items, I totally forgot where the prancing pony was. Eventually, I find it by walking up to every single door on the map. So Aragorn uses the dummies to trick the ring rates, and we journey on to Riverdale. Here you need to reach the summit with the hobbits. At this point the game becomes very samey, as it's almost non-stop combat against the same few enemy types until the end. Instead of a jump, Aragorn does a kick with the X button, which can come in handy. But trying to get it to land is nightmarish. Oh please god, just hit the thing. Here you fight orcs, or is it goblins? To be honest with you I have no idea which one they are. Anyway, the archers are fairly annoying. Don't try to have an archery battle with them, just run over and kill them. Oh, the enemy AI? Yeah, it's nothing special. So, you reach the runes at the summit. This triggers a troll boss fight. Well, they definitely look hideous anyway. I have to say, they've kinda got that Shrek, get out of my swamp vibe. 
Just keep your distance and shoot arrows. It's as simple as that. The boss fight ends and we get a CGI cutscene of that famous scene where Frodo is cornered by the ring rates, so he puts on the ring and gets stabbed. It looks real nice, but nothing looks like it does in the game. Frodo looks completely different and keep a close eye on the design of the ring rates. You protect Frodo as Aragorn next and the ring rates have a completely different design. Yeah, these guys love to gang up on me and spam me with the same attack all at once. You just gotta beat them up enough, moving on. Next you gotta clear the area of enemies for Frodo. There's more trolls to fight, but that's the extent of it. Just shoot arrows and you're all good. I haven't got much to say, because it's mostly just mindless gameplay. At the end we run into an elf sent by Elrond, and he gives Frodo his horse. Once again we get a very jarring CGI cutscene, where the river tramples the ring rates, and everything still looks off model. Anyway, I'll let Aragorn explain what happens. At Elrond's command, the waters of the River Bruinen swept the ringwraiths away. We entered the hidden elven valley of Rivendell. Elrond, the Lord of Rivendell, healed the wound made by the Morgul blade. Frodo awoke to a familiar face. So, we meet back up with Gandalf, and Elrond sets up the Fellowship of the Ring. The Fellowship of the Ring shall set forth to Mordor. The dwarves of Lonely Mountain still revere Bilbo, along with our greatest heroes. His bravery helped win back our mountain home from the dragon, Smaug. A most honorable hobbit is Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo helped you kill a dragon? Yeah, knowing where Bilbo came from, it was probably Puff the Magic Dragon. Look at Gimli here. First, he seems fairly normal sized to me. Second, the man is absolutely fucking jacked. Who knew steroids existed here? This is where we meet Bilbo, who gives Frodo the sword sting and the vest. We forged on, until an avalanche forced us to quit the mountain and seek another path. So, they head towards the Mines of Moria. Here you take control of Gandalf. So what instantly happens is the Fellowship abandons me. Oh, that classic video game cliche. The old, they're there in the cutscene, but nowhere to be seen in the gameplay. Okay, to be fair, maybe the game couldn't handle them all on screen at once. Gandalf has a magic meter and can use a selection of spells like Fireballs, Lightning, Attract, which I never used, the Shall Not Pass spell, and his most useful one, his Healing spell, which makes all the sections you play as him very easy. But I'm not complaining, as I'd say he's probably the most fun to play. I think it's because he's more options at his disposal than the other characters. Still, it's tedious as all hell. So, you're locked outside Moria, when we switch back to Aragorn to fight the easiest boss fight in the game, the Water Serpent. That's the fight, not much more to say about it, all you have to do is shoot arrows. Here the fellowship shows back up for the cutscene before leaving us again, except for Gimli who sticks around to help. Moria is vast and deep, with luck we can avoid all the orcs. That's funny Aragorn, because we do nothing but fight orcs non-stop. Yeah, this is a long stretch of very similar looking dark boring tunnels, where you fight waves after waves of enemies, while finding switches to open doors. Prepare to get lost a few times. Here's some cave trolls attack, and suddenly the entire fellowship are in the level and fighting the trolls. So much for the game not being able to handle them all on screen at once. You have to solve a simple puzzle, where you move the statues onto the platforms. Actually, I forgot you could move objects with the triangle button, so it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out. I'm pretty sure the fellowship had killed all the trolls by the time I realised what to do, but I got there in the end. Last stand here. The effort to retake Moria was valiant. Foolish. We should be moving on. Frodo, I fear the enemy is near. I will slay the foul beasts with my axe should they attack. Let us pass through this hall and find the others on the other side. I will do my best to offer my assistance. There was no cut there by me. That's exactly what happens. Suddenly, for no reason, Frodo and Gimli are separated from the group with no explanation. Back to Frodo, I guess. It's once again pitch black. You know the drill. Don't fight, just run. 
like Gandalf you're pulling switches. But here it's to connect bridges for Gimli. You need to climb a huge ladder up in order to reach the other side and pull the switch. Seems simple enough. So I connect the bridge here. Oh shit, more enemies are coming. No, no, get off the ladder, Frodo. I need to help Gimli. Oh, fuck me. This is why you don't fight enemies. I do it all over again and the same thing happens again. Third time, I lead the enemies towards Gimli and bolt it towards the exit. Oh yeah, now this is what I'm talking about. Boss fight with the bow. Yeah, he looks terrible. Like a bad Godzilla villain. <sighs> Look, there's the fellowship here watching me fight the thing like people would watch a sitcom. Okay, let me just save here. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> As you can imagine, he throws fireballs at you from a distance and hits you with his sword or close. All you need to do is strike him with the lightning spell, hit him a couple of times, back up, rinse and repeat. Out of the dark depths of Moria, and soon we reached the Golden Wood, Lothlorien. Here you meet Gladriel. Frodo offers her the ring, after which she does the whole psycho thing. And terrible is the morning and the night. All shall love me and despair. Before allowing you to continue your quest. Now we're in the final mission of the game. To start, all you have to do is clear out the enemies. Like we haven't done that enough. There was a new enemy type, the Orokai. You fight them just like everything else. This is where the game takes a strange turn. It looks like they're going to do the whole thing where Boromir betrays the group and tries to steal the ring from Frodo. Instead, a ring right riding a fell beast, well I think that's what it's called, captures Sam and we have to rescue him. This begins a gauntlet to the hilltop. What can you say? It's just fighting a lot more generic enemies. With some trolls and wolves thrown in for good measure. Frodo, I'll hold off the orcs. Climb to the top. I'll follow when I can. What exactly does Aragorn expect Frodo to do once he reaches the top? Defeat the ring right by himself? Yeah, it didn't go too well for him last time, Aragorn. Oh, no. So we run to the top as Frodo. Here the game throws countless enemies at you. But by now I know not to fight and just run past everything. Thus, it's not a problem. I reach the top and nothing happens. Just an awkward cutscene and we switch back to Aragorn to do it all over again. Hmm, how would I describe the final boss with the ring right on the dragon thing? Uh, well I think Yugi explains it best. I combined them to create Gaia, the dragon champion! Now my combo creature's attack power is raised to 2600. So all you do is whack it to death on the ground, then it flies into the air, you shoot one arrow into it, it then goes into a CGI cutscene, and well done, you've completed the game. The ending hints at a sequel that we never got. Honestly, it's the perfect ending. Awkward, looks unfinished, and I have no idea what happened. Sums up the entire game pretty well. To end this video, look, is the game bad? Absolutely. It fails on both levels. It's not a good game, and it's a fairly sloppily told version of the book. Even still, I appreciate its ambition and genuinely wouldn't mind if someone else took a crack at it in the future. So that's the fellowship. I'm just thankful they didn't make any more of these games. Oh no. Hey, this has been Jamie trying to add a bit more humour into the videos. If you prefer my dry or more humorous take, please let me know down in the comments below. Anyway, this has been Jamie on the fellowship, and if you made it this far into the video, I want to thank you for watching.